All right, hi everybody. Uh, in this video, we will go ahead and go through the solutions for the second exam. Uh, so let me go ahead and bring that up. All right, so I just have the second exam here. You can see there are six questions. Uh, so I'll try to add bookmarks on the video um, so you can just jump to the, the question you want. And uh, just recall that we discussed a few of these um, in class, but I'll go ahead and work through them here. Uh, just so you have a recorded reference for them. Okay, so in this uh, first question, uh, we have some unknown positive real numbers, capital lambda and capital omega. Uh, we know that they're real and we know that they're positive. Um, they're going to just be unknowns. We'll have to carry them throughout the problem. And the name of the game for this problem is to solve a bunch of equations for this independent variable x. Let me go ahead and zoom in on this first one. So the first thing I will do with any of these problems is maybe just as my first step, I'll write down a copy of the problem and just ensure that, you know, I'll double check to make sure I actually uh, wrote it down correctly, uh, especially if I'm doing my, my scratch work on separate paper. Okay, so I'm just gonna write this down. We'll have log base 10 of the quantity 3x plus capital omega and this is supposed to be equal to capital lambda. Okay, and before I make any other moves with this problem, I will go ahead and double check that I actually wrote it down correctly, and maybe triple check. Uh, so this is a very common mistake. Um, you know, just happen to write down the problem incorrectly and then it sort of throws off the rest of the problem. Um, so I think this is a good thing to build into your problem solving process of, you know, just write down, record exactly what the problem said, and then double, triple, quadruple check that you actually wrote it down correctly. Um, so my method is maybe I'll just check each side individually. So on the, the right hand side I have a capital lambda and I do have that on the right hand side down here so that, that checks out. Uh, maybe you want to check the base of the log. Okay, these are both uh, log base 10 so that matches up. And then maybe let's just check this argument of the log, the thing inside. It's 3x plus capital omega. And okay, that seems like it matches up. So now I feel pretty good about proceeding with the problem. Um, so right, I want to, in this kind of problem first, maybe, uh, okay, step zero, right, I guess was uh, write down the problem, double check that it matches up. Step one is um, maybe light up, identify what is the independent variable in this problem. And so I'll go ahead and take that X and just write it in purple, um, just to keep track of the fact that that's the thing we are trying to solve for. And I can see it's trapped inside of a log, so maybe before I even write anything down for this problem, let me lay out what my strategy is going to be. Um, so I see something trapped inside of a log base 10, and I notice on the left-hand side that that log base 10 is the only thing happening. And I know I have this pair of inverse functions, log base, well, anything, say alpha, and alpha, so log base alpha of x is one of the functions, and then alpha to the x is the other function, and these are an inverse pair. If I compose them in either order, these just give me x back. Um, so maybe just to sketch out what I'm saying here is that I have this inverse pair, well, log base alpha of x, and also alpha to the x. Um, so alpha can be any, well, maybe a positive uh, real number here, but it could be e, it could be 10, it could be 2, uh, sort of pick your favorite one. And I know that if I compose these in either order, so what does that mean? I just plug one into the other. So here I'm taking... Uh, I'm composing them in one order, so log base alpha of alpha to the x, that will just give me x back. And similarly, if I compose them in the other order, so I would need to take alpha, and instead of x, I need to plug in log base alpha of x, that this two will just give me back x. Okay. And it really didn't matter that this thing was called x in this problem, or you know, in this, this inverse pair property. This really could have just been anything, I'll call it question mark. And what it's doing is freeing that question mark for me. I have something up upstairs in the numerator, so alpha to the something, no matter what it is. I know that I can apply log base alpha to both sides, and the effect is on one side, the left-hand side, it's going to move that question mark down, um, put it downstairs for me. And the right-hand side might be complicated because I still had to apply log to it, but um, at least we freed something upstairs that we're trying to uh, solve for. Similarly, um, I have this kind of property down here for the other function where it didn't really matter what the argument of that log was. I, I called it x, but it could be some long, complicated expression. 
in composing these in either order just gives me that whatever that argument of the log was it just gives that back okay so that's just an aside of you know how are we going to approach these kinds of problems what's the approach to take and so the approach to take here is going to be well i want to free that x so i, I definitely want to um, undo this logarithm this log base 10 and so i'm going to raise both sides to the 10th power so i'm applying 10 to the x to both sides okay so that'll be my next logical step where perhaps i'll just take exactly what i had and just do an operation to both sides and so i'm just going to raise both sides to the 10th power i'm just being a little bit careful here to make sure that i raise uh, both sides well the entirety of both sides to the 10th power hi uh, camille is uh is visiting uh, i'll have to bookmark this in the video uh she's trying to help uh, okay <laughs> all right all right uh back to the task at hand <laughs> um i raised both sides to the 10th power um and i've just been really careful to raise the entirety of both sides to the 10th power and what i'm seeing here is that well, on the right hand side i'm left with something complicated so let me go ahead and start into my next step here on the right hand side i have this 10 to the capital lambda and that just is what it is it's a some some number lambda was some number that we don't know 10 is some number so 10 to the lambda is just some other number and it's equal to something and the whole point of doing this raising to the 10 operation was so i could free the thing that i uh, free that argument that i see on the left hand side so essentially everything inside of the parentheses to log here. The whole point of raising to the 10 was to bring that bring that out. So this is gonna come out as a 3x plus omega, and then maybe just to keep track, I'll light up that uh, the x, this independent variable that I'm really trying to solve for. But okay, my, my claim is that we've, we've done the, the hard part. We've done everything from unit two, now we're just back to unit one uh, business, and this is just some algebraic equation where I see the x and maybe I just need to rearrange a bunch of things to get uh, the x on one side and then all of the other stuff on the other side. So the first thing I'll do is just go ahead and subtract this capital omega from both sides. So I'll get a 3x equal to 10 to the lambda except now that I have to uh, subtract this capital omega on the right hand side. And again this thing that we're solving for this independent variable is x all right and i think we're just just about home free here uh, maybe i will multiply through this equation on both sides by one third from the left say so one third times this stuff and then one third times all of this stuff is essentially the operation i'm doing next just leave that out so i don't clutter up the equation too much but i get something that's well x equals some stuff Right, because that one third I essentially multiplied by by that one third uh, exactly in order to get rid of that three and then what am I what am I left with uh, paying the consequences of my actions on the right hand side well I just have a one third times everything on the right hand side so 10 to the capital lambda minus capital omega and now I think I'm done I see uh, something purple on the left hand side uh, my independent variable x and i see some stuff on the right hand side but the stuff on the right hand side is not purple i don't see any uh copies of my independent variable over there so that's how i know i've solved for x i have x in terms of things that are not x um, and in this case okay maybe it's a little bit scary because we have some other symbols floating around we have this capital uh, lambda and we have this capital omega but that's okay these are just uh numbers we don't know what the numbers are but they're just numbers so now i know that's how I know I'm done with the problem, uh, that I have x on one side and stuff not involving x on the other side, so I will go ahead and box it, uh, put a period on it. Uh, maybe I will highlight in there something to indicate to the reader that this is my final answer for the problem. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next problem. So we're given this capital lambda. Now this, this x minus one is appearing upstairs, uh, that whole quantity x minus one. And this thing is equal to a capital omega. So I'm just going to do the exact same thing as I did for uh, part A. I'm just going to rewrite the equation first. So I have capital lambda to the x minus 1 equal to k 
capital uh, Omega, which is quite difficult <laughs> to draw. Um, okay, so again, the, what is my, my step zero here? Before I do anything, I just want to check that I've written down this equation correctly so I don't go through all of this, this trouble of solving the equation and then find out that, oh gosh, I, I wrote down a, a 2 instead of a 1 or something, and then have to redo all of my work. So it's good, again, just to build this into your problem-solving process, literally every problem you solve. Um, that's sort of good uh, mathematical hygiene. Uh, save yourself some headache down the line. So again, maybe I'll just check the right-hand side of the equality. I had this capital omega originally, and oh good, I have a capital omega showing up in the, the equation that I wrote down. I have a lambda showing up on the left-hand side, and indeed the lambda is showing up there. And maybe something that could go wrong here is that uh, here I had the x minus 1 all up in the exponent, and I just want to double check that all of this is up in the exponent and what I wrote down as well. So it's very common to incorrectly, um, you know, have this one, uh, you know, appear downstairs or something like that. But that's an entirely different problem. Okay, so sorry, Camille is uh, trying to help <laughs> with the lectures again. So. Um, Okay, so I, I, I've written down the problem correctly, so that's my step zero. My step one is that I'd like to maybe independ uh, light up the, the independent variable, figure out what I'm solving for. There it is. I see it's stuck upstairs. It's up in the exponent. Um, and so I have a tool to help me move things uh, upstairs, downstairs. Right, I have logs, and really any log uh, will do the job here. Um, so all of these logs have the property that um, I can move exponents out of the log. Um, so maybe I will just go ahead and apply, and apply uh, some log to both sides, but I won't, I won't choose which one yet. Maybe I'll choose one a little bit later to make my life somewhat easier. Uh, maybe. We'll see what happens. So what I will do is maybe just apply log base alpha to both sides. So this is my next step. I'm just applying log base alpha to both sides, being very careful to apply it to the entirety of the left-hand side and then also to the entirety of the right-hand side. And then also just being careful that I kept all of that, um, the stuff that was in the exponent before is still up in the exponent. Maybe I don't want to skip too many steps here because um, I might uh, lose track of uh, where that goes. So I'll just light up again my independent variable. It's still stuck upstairs. But I the whole reason of uh, doing this log business was because it has this very nice property. Uh, so let me make a little bit of room here, move this off to the side. What I see happening is that um, inside of the log, I see this, this entire argument of the log um, all raised to some exponent. So this is like my favorite situation to be in with a logarithm where the entire argument is raised to an exponent because then I know I can always uh, do this kind of maneuver where I take that entire exponent and just go ahead and move it out in front. Okay. And I'm just going to add a set of parentheses here to be careful, um, you know, in case there's, so this is like a complicated, uh, you know, there are multiple terms happening here, and maybe later on I'll need to multiply it, maybe distribute these terms out or something. So I'm just going to put a set of parentheses around them to, to indicate that they're, they're grouped together, and they're all multiplying uh, this term that's left, just this logarithm. Okay, but now I think... Um, well, we could do a lot of things here. Um, we, we've done the hard part. We've done the, the unit two stuff. We've applied some logarithm to move things downstairs. So now we're back to unit one stuff, which is just, just solving an algebraic equation. Um, so maybe, I mean, one thing I could do here is take this logarithm, maybe divide it over, and then maybe I would need to add a one to both sides, and then I would get x by itself. Um, but maybe I can save myself a little bit of a headache here by noting that this alpha was something I just kind of, I didn't specify. This was some symbol, some arbitrary number I, I picked in the middle of the problem, um, or didn't pick, you know, but I introduced it. It wasn't part of the original problem. Uh, so maybe now's a good time to go ahead and pick an alpha that'll uh, somehow make a, you know, maybe save us a few steps in this equation. And it, as usual, um, these kinds of problems, I have two, two choices for alpha, and both of them are, are pretty good. Um, well, there are two natural choices. You could choose anything. You could choose, uh, you know, alpha equals e to take to take the natural log, and that would be totally fine. You would just go through exactly what I said before of dividing stuff over and adding one. Um, 
but maybe just to save myself a little bit of trouble, um, I could set alpha equal to, well, this capital omega is just some number, and alpha is supposed to be some number, so I could just set alpha to be capital omega, and then this whole side would be one, and that'd be pretty nice. Um, I can also set alpha to be capital lambda. Lambda is the same, you know, it's just some unknown number, so I could set my unknown alpha to this unknown lambda. And maybe I'll go ahead and do that, um, because that saves me a step of uh, dividing things. And maybe just to be really explicit here, um, I'll write out exactly what's happening. So this x minus 1, nothing's changed there. And I want to simplify this term, and this is a really, really important property. Um, what, is this, what is this equal to? Well, I ask myself, what question does this answer? This, everything inside of this box. Well, it answers the question, what power do I raise the pink to to get this blue term, the argument of the log? What power do I raise the base of the log to to get the argument of the log? Okay, and the argument here is the exact same thing as the base. I can think of it as, so they're both capital lambda. I can think of capital lambda as capital lambda to the first power. So what power do I have to raise lambda to to just get lambda to the first power? Well, it's definitely just a, a one. So this whole thing is just going to be a 1, and that's kind of why I, I chose that. It's because it made my life easier on the left-hand side. The right-hand side just is what it is, log base lambda of capital omega. It's just some number. We don't know what it is, but it is a number. And Maybe I'll go ahead and get rid of this 1. Hopefully it's clear, clear to the reader. Once we go from this step to this step, we only did one thing, which was simplifying that log. Um, and it's just equal to 1, so I'm just leaving it like that. And then maybe I can get rid of these parentheses too, because now x minus 1 is the only thing happening on the left-hand side, so I don't have to worry about distribute, <coughs> distributing it out or anything like that. And now the last thing I need to do is just take, uh, I guess, add 1 to both sides. So I get an x equal to a log base lambda of omega, and then a plus 1. And I know that I'm done with the problem because I see purple on the left-hand side and no purple on the right. So I will go ahead and box this up, put a period on it, uh, maybe highlight it for my reader just to indicate that this is the solution to the question they asked. And again, the, the stuff on the right looks a little bit scary, but it doesn't involve x. That's the key point. Um, everything else is just some unknown number. Okay, so now we're at part C. And uh, first thing I will do, well, the zeroth thing I will do, my step zero all the time, is literally just write down the problem again. So I have 1 over lambda to the x, and then a plus 1 outside of that. And that will be equal to 1 over capital Omega. Okay, and again, step zero, uh, I've written down the problem. Let me just really double and triple check that I actually wrote it down correctly. So there's my 1 over capital Omega sitting on the right-hand side. Oh, good. It looks like that matches up. I have something in the denominator on the left-hand side and just a 1 in the numerator. And Okay, this looks like something in the denominator and a 1 in the numerator. I think I'm good so far. What might be tricky here is that there's a lambda to the x happening there and a plus 1 is happening outside of the exponent. So a common mistake here is to try and write this as lambda to the x plus 1, which is a very different problem. Um, so I would just double check that I have this plus one uh, outside of what's happening to this lambda to the x, totally separate. And okay, it indeed looks like that's, that's the case, so now I'll go ahead and proceed and start with the problem. So I think the first thing I'd like to do is I see a bunch of denominators, um, and gosh, you know, I, I really don't want to write things with multiple lines, so maybe I can do some stuff to get it all on one single line and not have to worry about fractions anywhere. So. Uh, the name of the game is to clear denominators. Anytime I see fractions, this is a, usually a good idea um, to make forward progress in the problem. Um, and so I could do that one of two ways. I mean, one way to think about that is to multiply through by capital um, omega. So I just multiply this side by capital omega and the right-hand side. And I would get an omega upstairs on the left-hand side. And then after that step, I would multiply through by this lambda x plus 1 
and that would cancel the one that's happening on this side and then put it upstairs on this side. So that's exactly the same thing as the shortcut we know of cross multiplication. So I know that this will be equal to this. There is a process there that's worth going through, but we have a shortcut for it. And I guess maybe if I'm being really careful, if, you know, it's the one appearing there times this omega appearing there equal to this lambda x plus one from the left hand side multiplied by the numerator on the right hand side. But okay, I'm being a little bit ridiculous, like we don't need to keep track of the ones. I'm just pointing that out because, you know, if that, that numerator wasn't a one, then you would really want to keep track of, you know, which side does it need to go on. So okay, maybe I'll just go ahead and delete those now that we have them there. Okay, so I've cross multiplied, I have everything on one line. Um, I see some stuff happening in the exponent, but also there's some other stuff, this addition of one. So I think I just want to move everything. So again, what am I trying to do? I want to light up this independent variable, this thing I'm trying to find. There it is, it's upstairs. And it's still upstairs after I do this cross multiplication. I'd like it so that um, anything involving x is just the only thing happening on one side. If I can arrange that situation, I try to go for it. So my so that was just a, a step we took. The next step will be, uh, let's just subtract one from both sides. So there's omega minus one on the left-hand side, and then my capital lambda to the x on the right-hand side. And again, the x is the thing I'm trying to solve for. It's upstairs. I know that, well, I can apply a log, any log, my favorite log, or even a log I don't even choose the base of. Um, they all have this the same property that they'll help me move things from the exponent down. So let me just do that. So on the left-hand side, I will have log base, well, alpha, maybe I'll pick it later, of this omega minus, it's not a great omega, this uh, omega minus one on the left-hand side, and, well, log base alpha of capital lambda to the x on the right-hand side. And just to be explicit, maybe I'll put in one more step. Of course, you don't really need this in your work. You can, um, you know, do as much as you want on your scratch work. As long as you're showing the reader the process. Um, I just see that the argument of this log, so everything inside of the parentheses, is all raised to um, a power x. So I know that's my favorite situation to be in because I can just take that power of x and move it out in front. And I'm just going to be careful to maybe put it in a parentheses here, um, yeah, just in case there were more terms or something. Okay, so now I'm in a situation where I have logs on both sides, and gosh, I guess I could take this thing on the right and divide it over, and then I would have uh, the answer. I would have solved for x, uh, and that would be fine. Uh, what I could also do, um, and again, you could just you could have chosen log base ten, you could have chosen uh, alpha equals e, you could have you know taken the natural log of both sides, um, and this would be totally valid here. But I say let's let's save ourselves a little bit of work, um, and let's go ahead and choose this alpha now. So this alpha was, we just applied some some arbitrary log, and we didn't choose one. But let's choose one now. And I think uh, maybe to make my life easier, let's just choose alpha equal to uh, this unknown lambda. I could also choose it to be equal to this omega minus one, but then I would still have to divide some stuff over. Um, so I think this will be the easiest. And why is that? Well, it's because I have this entire thing again. And the whole point of this was that I can reduce this term here. And I just asked myself, what question does this answer? Well, it's what power do I raise the base to, so pink, to get the argument? And here that's uh, green. And that thing is capital lambda to the one. So this whole thing is just going to be one. So all of that times one. Uh, let me just light up this independent variable again. That's the thing we're trying to solve for. And it seems like we're done, right? So the one didn't matter. I can delete these parentheses. And I see something purple on one side and no purple on the other side. So that tells me I've solved for x. Again, in terms of some other unknown uh, numbers, capital lambda and capital omega, but they're just numbers. So omega is some number. Omega minus one is some different number. 
log base lambda of some number is just some other number. So I have x in, as some, some number. So maybe I'll box it, put a period on it, highlight it to indicate to the reader that this is the solution to the question they asked, which was, again, just solve for x, right? Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at number two. We're playing the exact same game as we were in number one. We have some equations and we're solving for x. So the first uh, or the zeroth thing I will do in all of these problems is literally just write down, uh, let me zoom in a bit. I will literally just write down the problem that I had. So it's a seven times two to the x is equal to eight times three to the x. And I will double, triple, quadruple check just to make sure I wrote down the problem correctly. So that matches up with that, seems okay. That matches up with that, that matches up with that, and that matches up with that. I just wouldn't want to do this entire problem and then find out that I'd written down something incorrectly at the start. Okay, so I'm trying to solve for this independent variable, x. And I see it's upstairs. Uh, so this is my, my context indicator that uh, you know, maybe a logarithm is going to help me out here. Logarithms help me move things from exponents uh, downstairs. So I guess I have some choices. Um, I could, I could, you know, maybe try to like divide the seven over and then apply logs to both sides. That probably work. Um, I could try to divide this eight over and apply logs to both sides. That would still work. Maybe I'll just go ahead and apply logs without doing anything because I see that um, when I take the log of this stuff, I'm going to have a multiplication inside of the log. And that's okay. I have a, a log rule that helps me move multiplications uh, out of the log. I would not want to do this if this was something like 7 plus 2, because then I would be stuck with uh, an addition or a subtraction. So if this was like a, an 8 minus 3x, um, I would not want, to apply, not want to apply logs to both sides here, because then I would have an addition or a subtraction stuck inside of a log, and I don't have any log properties that'll help me, uh, you know, separate those or move those out or anything. So we are very lucky to be in the case where this is just multiplication. So I know that applying logs will be a good idea. So, okay, I'll just apply log base or something. I won't even choose it yet. Say alpha to the left-hand side. And I'll just be sure to apply it to the entire left-hand side. And I'll also apply it to the right-hand side. Okay, um, and what will I do now? Well, I have this, this log property that helps me move multiplication. So I'll light it up in blue here. Multiplication inside of the log will change into addition outside of the log. So how does that go? I'm just rewriting, so I'm using a log property here, but this will be log base alpha of seven. So just this first term there. And then the multiplication comes out as plus. And then I get another log, base alpha, of 2 to the x. And that's the, the left-hand side. The right-hand side, I'll just play the same game. So log base alpha of 8. And this multiplication inside the log turns into addition outside of the log. So I get a log base alpha of 3 to the x. And I'll just light up. To remind myself that the x, this independent variable x, was the thing I was trying to solve for. Uh, gosh, this is getting pretty complicated. Um, hmm. I think maybe now is a good time to go ahead and choose this alpha, because I think we can make our lives a little bit easier. So let's just make a copy of this, because there are so many terms floating around. Um, actually, let's let's take one more step before we choose the log. So just remember that these were all pluses. And let me just stretch this out a little bit to give ourselves some room. What I want to do now is I see in this step up here, I had some log of something. And the argument of that log, well, the entire argument was raised to some power x. So I know that's my favorite situation to be in. I can pull that exponent, again, because it's applied to the entire argument. Um, that's that's what lets me pull it out. So I get this x out in front. There we go. And I'm just left with this log base alpha of 2 on the left-hand side. And I'm just going to play the exact same game on the right-hand side. 
I see that this uh, argument here is all raised to some power, so I can take that power and move it out. And I'm left with log base alpha of three, and it comes out as multiplication. Okay, but now let me look at this, this step here. This is maybe where I want to uh, choose this alpha, maybe just to simplify things and make my life a little bit easier um, so I don't have to carry around as many terms. So I could choose log base 10, that's fine, alpha equals 10. Um, I would still have four terms hanging around, I would just have to juggle them to solve for x. Uh, I could choose, you know, alpha equals z, it could be taking the natural log, sort of the same situation, it's not going to simplify any of these terms, they're all just going to be natural logs and I'll still have to juggle a bunch of stuff. Um, so maybe I can choose alpha, well okay, I could choose it to be 7, uh, in which case this thing would become a 1, which would be pretty nice. Um, I could choose alpha to be equal to 3, in which case this thing would become a 1, which would be pretty nice. But I also noticed that I could choose, we'll say, alpha equals 2, and that might make my life uh, the most easiest here, because let's just go ahead and do it and see what happens. So let's just do 2 everywhere. And the observation I'm going to, to use here is that well, okay, so this one over here on the left-hand side, this this thing here is just going to be a 1. Uh, but I also, for free, get that this one is going to simplify a little bit too, because the inside uh, is a power of 2. So 8 is just 2 to the third power. And so what I'm, what I'm going to see happen here is that this thing is equal to 1. That's what will happen in my next step. And what will happen here is well, again, I just asked myself, what question does this, this thing answer? Well, it's what power do I raise pink to to get the blue? So what power do I raise the base of the log to to get the argument of the log? Well, the argument here is 2 cubed, and so the power I need to raise 2 to in order to get 2 cubed is definitely just a 3. So I'm going to get some actual numbers out of this, which will be pretty nice. So what I get is, well, log base 2 of 7, who knows what it is, I might plug it into my calculator later, I might not, uh, let's just keep it around for now. I get an x times a 1, because this thing was just log base 2 of 2, and that's all that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, I'm seeing that this thing was a 3, and okay, then I'm left with whatever this was, this was like a plus x times log base 2 of 3. Okay, gosh, we are really in the weeds. What are we trying to, to solve for again? It was this x, this independent variable. And maybe let me just delete this one. We don't have to keep track of multiplying by 1. Okay, so I mean, the name of the game always is where we're down to like a, a unit 1 situation now. We've done all of the hard unit 2 stuff. So now it's just juggle everything around and get x um, by itself on one side. So what I'll do is I'll keep this x on this side. There it is. And I'll take this and move it to that side as well. So I get a minus x log base 2 of 3. And I just want all of that to be on the, the left hand side because then I see my, my purple x is there. And let me just move everything else off to the other side. Well, I see a 3 that I left over on this right-hand side. And then there was this thing which was on the left. I need to move it to the right, so it'll come in with a negative sign. If you want, um, what I just did here is, well, I subtracted log base 2 of 7 from both sides. And then I also added x log base 2 of 3 to both sides. Um, just kind of did both at once. So just rearranging some of, some of these uh, equations. Okay, we're running out of room, but fortunately we are just about done, I think. So let me go up here and just copy down what we have. Okay, so that, that was what we had before. What I want to do now is, uh, yeah, I really want to factor out this x. So I see an x being multiplied to two terms here. So what I want to see is x by itself, just one copy of x. Well, there's my one copy of x. And I just need to figure out what goes in this set of parentheses. And this will just be equal to, well, I won't even do anything to the right-hand side. 
Okay, and this is a, a little bit tricky. Um, yeah, just you have to be a little bit careful. Um, when you pull an x out of this, you're left with a one here. So there's the one. When you pull an x out of this, you're left with that log base two of three. And this minus sign, of course, stays around. Um, and this is a step where I would actually try, so I've run it forward, uh, but really I kind of reasoned about it starting from this and going backwards. So I thought about this thing and then I realized that if I multiply this out and distribute it in, I get exactly this thing I saw in the previous step. So that's kind of how I knew what to do for the next step. So anytime you do an operation like this where you're maybe not sure if you did it quite right, so we've tried running it forward by pulling out an x, just make sure you can run it backward. So try and multiply this x in to those two terms and make sure you get the thing you had before. So if you want, this is like an arrow that goes in two directions. I mean, they all are, but... Um, but okay, so now that I have this, I am just about done. Uh, so I'm just going to take this thing, uh, put a, well, just going to divide this thing out, right? So I want it to go over to the other side. And I just have to be careful to divide the entire right-hand side by all of this stuff. And the only thing I'm left with on the left-hand side is x. So I have purple on one side, purple x, my independent variable that I'm trying to solve for. And everything else on the other side is not purple. So it does not involve x. So that's how I know that I am done. Okay, and I will just box it, put a period on it, highlight it, to tell my reader that that's the, the solution uh, they were looking for. Okay, so let's look at 2b, uh, or not to b, but yes, definitely 2b. Um, step zero, as usual. Uh, well, pick the right stylus, I guess it's step negative one. Step zero is, uh, I'll just write down the question again. So this is a log of x squared plus 1 minus a log of x plus 1 being set equal to 2. And let's just remember the name of the game. We want to solve for this independent variable x that I'm lighting up. And I should be careful, I just skipped a step. Right? That was my step 1, was finding this independent variable. My step 0 is just double checking, did I write down the question correctly? Okay, the twos match up, the x plus ones match up, the x squared plus one matches up, and the logs match up. I guess I should be a little bit careful. Uh, so it's it's a log that's just written there with no base. Um, and so we, you know, when I'm writing it in class, I don't do this, but this is a convention out there in the world. Um, you know, if people write a log with no base, depending on what context you're in, it's, it's usually a log base 10. So I'll, I will just go ahead and add that in. When it's not specified, say on a calculator or something, um, it's usually a log base 10. But it really depends on what field you're in. For If you're doing computer science or something, a log might always be log base 2 because you're counting it in binary, you know, 0 and 1. If you're doing, you know, sort of mathematical stuff, you might, uh, log might always mean uh, log base e, the natural log. Um, so as, as, a, as a good practice, just always put, you know, a base on whatever log you write. Okay, so now that I've identified the problem, I know what I need to solve. And I guess there are a number of things I could do here. I'm seeing this log base 10, and I know that, uh, well, I have an inverse function pair for this where I raise uh, you know, 10 to the something power, and I know that I can undo the log base 10 by doing this operation. Um, but maybe I don't want to raise both sides to the 10th power right away, because if I do that, you know, 10 squared on the right and then 10 to all of this stuff on the left, I can't exactly cancel immediately. Um, what I really need to see is 10 to the log base 10 of just this stuff, um, you know, some logarithm applied to some stuff and that'll free that stuff for me. But the problem is, is that I have all of this other stuff uh, kind of in the way. So I can't directly apply my, my inverse function uh, theorem. Um, of course, I could like split out the exponents here. That would that would work fine. I could use my exponent properties. Uh, totally equivalent, equivalently, I could use my log properties first to combine them and then do a log base 10 later. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do that just because it's a little bit less writing, but both ways actually end up working. So the first thing I'll do is use the fact that a subtraction 
outside of a log. Well, maybe just to be careful, let me do it this way. I'm gonna copy this down. And okay, I'm gonna think of this in sort of a funny way. Um, I'm gonna think of this as adding on, well, negative one times that log I saw before. And why am I doing that? Well, it just helps me keep track of this negative one, which might get lost otherwise. Um, what I can do in the next step is I have something out in front of a log, and I know that what I can always do is just take something in front of a log and put it up in the exponent. So let me just do that. Um, what I need to do is take the entire argument of the log, what I saw before, and then I can apply the exponent to all of that stuff. Okay, so that's x plus one to the, the negative first power. So that's the result of moving this upstairs. This whole thing is equal to two. And just the point of this maneuver is that, um, gosh, yeah, I, I don't remember all of these log rules, but I definitely remember that a, a plus outside of a log gets changed to a multiplication inside of a log. And it turns out that, you know, a minus gets turned, in, turned into a division. You can just go directly to that. But maybe I just only want to remember this, this plus rule. But now I'm in totally fine shape because I just have this plus. I've cooked up a situation where that's the only thing that appears between them. And so now I can just do this log combination rule again. Addition outside gets turned into multiplication inside. And so this x squared plus 2, well, it just comes along for the ride. There it is. And everything in the other log also comes along for the ride. There it is. And then they get combined with, well, this plus on the outside gets changed to a, well, not a plus on the inside, but rather a multiplication. And all of that happens inside the argument to this, this log. And that whole thing is still just equal to two. Okay, maybe I'll just do one quick step here. If I zoom in a little bit. Um, so I'm being a little bit silly. This is something raised to the negative first power. That's the same thing as one over that thing. So this is really log base 10 of, I'll just go ahead and combine them. It's you know x squared plus one over x plus one. Again, because this multiplied by one over this, I can just go ahead and multiply those, those fractions together. And this whole thing is equal to uh, two. Okay, so let me just make a copy of this. We can modify it elsewhere. Okay, so that's what we had before. And what I will do in the next step is now I'm, I'm in a good situation where I just see log base 10 applied to some stuff. Um, and that's the only thing happening on one side. So that's a great situation to uh, take the log of both sides, or sorry, apply, uh, raise both sides. Okay, apply 10 to the somethingth power to both sides. There we go. 10 to that power is equal to 10 to the power of the other side. Okay, but now I'm seeing my, my canceling pair. I'm seeing 10 to the log base 10. Maybe I'll just go ahead and take off these parentheses now since we know that we're just raising, putting both sides up in the exponent, the entirety of both sides. Um, and I see that there's nothing in the way. If there was some kind of number here um, out in front of this log, that would kind of be in the way and I wouldn't be able to um, just cancel things. Um, but here I just see these two functions composed. And so I know that that allows me to free this whole argument here. And so I just get that by itself. It's x squared plus 1 over x plus 1. And the right hand side, well, it just stays what it is. 10 squared, let's go ahead and write that as 100. Um, okay, so again, we're in the weeds. What was I trying to do? I was trying to solve for this independent variable x. So I'm just going to light it up. Um, I'm not quite done because I don't see x equals something. I do see a lot of purple on the left hand side and no purple on the right hand side but I'd like to just see x equals something to solve for x. So I see stuff in the denominator though, and I know that uh, my favorite trick is to move everything out of denominators, so to clear denominators. And how will I do that? 
well, really just by multiplying both sides by x plus 1 here. So I'll just be really careful to take 100 and then multiply it by x plus 1, the quantity x plus 1, just to remember that I have to distribute that, so I'm going to keep the parentheses around. And okay, now I have no denominators, but I have purple on both sides, but that's fine. Let's go ahead and fix that. So all I'm going to do is, well, I want to move this term onto that side, so that's fine. I'll just do that, but it comes in with the negative sign, and then the right-hand side is equal to zero. All right, and now I'm seeing something that's, you know, it's a little bit better. All the the purple x's are on one side. I don't see x equals something yet. Um, so maybe what I want to do is I notice that I, I have something that looks like a quadratic. So I see a bunch of powers of x. Well, really just this x to the 2, and there's an x to the 1. But the highest power of x is a 2, so that's telling me this is a quadratic in x. So let me just try to write it in the sort of standard uh, form. So maybe there should be an x squared out in front. And that's just picking up that term. And then there should be like a plus x times something. And what should that something be? Well, there's a negative 100x coming from there. And then I should have a plus some, well, some constant term. So I just have to figure out what did I, what did I not take care of uh, yet? Well, there's a plus 1 that I didn't have. Well, let me just put a, a 1 there, leave the plus out. And there, by distributing this in, I get a minus 100. So there's my minus 100. OK, but I'll simplify this immediately. 1 minus 100 is, well, negative 100 minus 1, so negative 99. And that whole thing is equal to 0. Ah, uh, good. But now I see I'm in a situation where I just have a formula that does the work for me. Um, I guess this is telling me that I can think of, you know, a equals 1, and then b equals negative 100, and c equals negative 99, and I can do the quadratic formula. All right, so I can just get, uh, let me just mark that we had a bunch of x's here. The quadratic formula lets us go to x equals stuff, and we can just write out what that stuff is. And gosh, uh, I'm always hard pressed to remember exactly what the quadratic formula is. Let's see, how does it go? Uh, b squared, or hmm, let's see, it should, it should be negative b, right? So plus 100, plus or minus some stuff, and the stuff will involve b squared, so negative 100 squared, which is the same as just 100 squared. Just simplify that right away. Minus 4 times a, which is 1, so I'll leave that out times c, which is negative 99. And let me go ahead and move this negative sign out. It becomes a plus there. And you need to raise all this stuff to the 1 half power. Same thing as the square root, if you like. And then I take all of this over 2 times a. a was just equal to 1. So, I mean, there it is. Uh, and you know what? Honestly, I would probably just leave it like this, maybe all of this under a square root if you like and there you go now I have x equal to some stuff and the stuff just involves numbers uh, in this case all of the numbers are known uh, and I would just leave this as the answer because if you plug it into your calculator I imagine that you will get um, some decimal and you would have to take some kind of approximation uh, but as usual you know we'd rather just keep the exact answer around in case you know yeah, doesn't you know if you if you want to approximate it with your 10 digit digit calculator that's fine but maybe you know you're doing a NASA, uh, you know, trying to land something on another planet, maybe you need many, many more digits than that. So you can just give them this exact form and they'll compute it on their supercomputer for as, as accurately as they'd like. Okay, so that's some exact form. I will just go ahead and leave it like that. I will box it, period, put a period on it, and highlight it so the reader knows that that's the answer they should go looking for. Okay, and uh, I guess we have one more problem here, this part C. First thing I will do, or the zero thing, is just write it again. e to the x squared plus 1 is equal to e to the 2x. And I will double and triple check that I actually wrote it down correctly. The things to notice here are that the 2x is all up in the uh, exponent on the right-hand side. And, okay, I got that right. Everything's upstairs. 
And over here, on the left-hand side, this x squared plus 1, again, that whole quantity is in the exponent. And that's great, because that's exactly what's happening in what I've written down. Okay, so I have a bunch of x's upstairs. I have this independent variable I'm going to light up that I want to solve for. Everything's upstairs. I know logs are going to help me move things downstairs. In this case, maybe I'll just go directly instead of doing this log base alpha business. I see that my base is E, so I might as well just do a natural log. So what's going to happen is that I'll take a natural log of, well, E to the x squared plus 1, really just a natural log of both sides, E to the 2x. And what I can do now is my favorite game. I see the entire arguments of these logs uh, applied to some power. And I know that, well, any log would give me this property, but in particular, the natural log does. It lets me move things out. Uh, so it goes from upstairs to downstairs. I'm going to put a set of parentheses around it, and then note that it comes out with a multiplication. I'm just left with this natural log of e. And then just the same game on the right-hand side, this 2x. Again, just double-checking that this entire argument is raised to the 2x power. That's what lets me do this. So I can move it out. And, okay, now I'm just being a little bit ridiculous. I have right the natural log of e. This is asking me what power. So natural log is a log base e. What power do I raise e to to get e? Well, that's definitely just a 1. And I have the same thing over here. Okay, so I can get rid of these parentheses and kind of clean things up a little bit. So I have x squared plus 1 is equal to 2x. The thing I was trying to solve for was x, and I have purple on both sides. That's fine. Let's just go ahead and fix it in our next step. So what I'll do is, well, I want to move this 2x to the same side as everything else. It has to come in with a negative sign because I did that. And on the right-hand side, I'm just left with a 0. So that's my next step. And, okay, maybe in just one more step, I'll just write it out in a little bit nicer form. It's x squared minus 2x plus 1. And that's equal to 0. And I guess you could maybe just do the quadratic formula here. I mean, that always works. I, I have a quadratic, so it's an x raised to the second power. It's the highest term appearing. Um, I think this factors, though, let me see. Just double check. I want to say it's x minus 1 times x minus 1. And why does this work? Well, this thing is supposed to be the, the product of the two uh, numbers appearing. So this thing times this thing should be equal to that. And that's true. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. And then the sum of these two guys is supposed to be equal to this thing in the middle. Oh, but that's also true. Negative 1 plus a negative 1 is a negative 2. So I know that this is the, the factorization. And okay, I'm being a little bit silly. I've written it twice, but it's really just that thing squared equal to 0. And now I'm just going to use my favorite property of the real numbers that if a... Well, okay, maybe I'll, I'll do this. If anything squared is equal to 0, then, well, say x minus 1 is equal to 0. I guess just taking the square root of both sides and taking the square root of 0 is totally fine. Uh, and yeah, so I think I want to say now that x is just equal to 1. Actually, I, do, I, I think I do want to do this a slightly different way that maybe uses something we've seen before. So x minus 1 times x minus 1 is equal to 0. So I just have two things that are equal to 0. So I know that I'm in the real number. So if a product of things equals 0, then I can conclude that one of them is equal to 0. So either the first one is equal to 0, or so that's from that one. The second one equals 0, and that's from that one. And they just happen to be the same. And so from this, I can conclude that x equals 1. Maybe a little bit cleaner. You don't have to worry about uh, when you take the square root of something squared, oh gosh, something goes, you know, I mean, you have to put in a plus or minus, maybe you have to check some things. So maybe this is a little bit nicer way to do it. Okay, and that x was the thing I was trying to solve for all along, and now I have x on one side and a number on the other side. 
and in particular purple on one side and no purple on the other side so that's how i know i've solved for x so i'll box it highlight it put a period on it and that is the the solution okay so let's move on to, to question three so the name of the game here is that uh, we're given some situations and we want to uh, you know, come, up with a, come up with a formula or build a function uh, to model these situations. Okay, so in this first one, we're given uh, some, some kind of exponential growth. Uh, and we're given two data points for this exponential growth. Um, so I guess I should say, yeah, what are we, what are we looking at here? Um, we're looking at some exponential growth function, w of t. And I'll say what the, we have like a general equation for that, but I'll say what it is in a second. Um, and then I'm given these two data points. There is w of zero is equal to four. So I'm just writing down the information from the problem. w of uh, zero is equal to four. And then also w of two is equal to six. So two data points, and then we have some function and we want to, to build that function from these data points. And I know that if I, so the, in bold here, I have that this is exponential growth. And from class, I know that we have a formula that, that models these, these types of situations. And we have a general form for it. It's, well, uh, w of t is equal to w naught times e to the rt. And I'll just be careful here because t is just the name of my independent variable. It didn't really matter what I called it. It could have been t or x or L, I mean, it's just a name. Uh, but I also have these two unknown numbers, or these parameters in the problem, R and W0. And if I want to write a function uh, to model something, I want to plug things into that function so I can go and evaluate it, right? If I want to predict something out in the future, or learn something about some time in the past, or in general, just learn things about, so I only measured these, these two data points, but I want to learn something about other data points that I didn't measure. Um, then I want to actually get numbers for this this r and this w naught, so I can plug in a time and then get it on get out an actual number. Okay, so we saw a little bit of how to do this in class, uh, but this is kind of a nice situation. So what I'll do is let's let's work on this one first. This w of zero is equal to four, so I'm just going to write that over here. W of zero is equal to four. So that's one name for w of zero. But I have another name for it. Well, here's w of, well, anything. So let me go ahead and, oh, we lost a, <laughs> should be an r there. So let me just copy this over here. So this was w at t, but here I'm plugging in this, this purple t equals zero. So this should be a times zero happening up there. And then, well, this thing here, I'm raising something to the zeroth power, and anything to the zeroth power is just going to be one. The only tricky situation is if the, the base is also zero, but here it's not, so right, what is zero to the zero? Okay, you have to decide. Um, but this is just some, some positive number to the zeroth power, so that's just a one. So this thing is just equal to w naught, well, times one if you want, but we don't have to keep track of that if it's multiplication. But okay, I have two names for the same thing, one of them is four, and one of them is w naught, and w naught is one of the things I needed to find a number for. So that's one piece of the equation, or one piece of what we, one piece of information that we need, um, that we have now. And going back to the original equation, so there was one of the pieces, that's the other piece that we need, this r. How are we going to get that? Well, I've already used this piece of data, so I guess I need to use now this piece of data. Right? It, it wouldn't quite make sense if I had, um, you know, I have this equation and I have two unknown numbers that I need to pin down and one piece of data is not enough information to pin that down. With one piece of data, if I'm lucky, I can pin down like one of these parameters maybe. But if I have two unknowns, I kind of need two equations. So let's use this other one now. W of two is equal to six. So I have a name for W of two. Well, it's six. It's given to us by the problem. And I have another name for W2. Let me just go up here and grab it. Uh, 
Let's copy that. So there it is. Oh gosh, but that has a T in it. No problem. I am plugging in two for T in this equation. So I get a times two there instead. And actually I can do one better. I actually know a name for W naught as well. If I go back over here, we found it. That was uh, one piece of this problem right there. So we have W naught is actually equal to four and that's gonna be the key piece of information that lets us solve this problem. Okay, so now I have two names for the same thing, so I can set them equal to each other, these two guys. So I have four e to the two r, coming from this, it's just equal to this, which is six. So that's a step. Um, I need to solve for r, this is the parameter I want to pin down. So I'm just gonna take a step by dividing through by four, and I get e to the two r is equal to three halves, after I take six and divide by four, and now I'm gonna apply a natural log to both sides. Maybe I'll skip a step. Say that that is two r, which is equal to the natural log of three halves. Again, I've just skipped, um, I've taken the natural log of the left-hand side. I've moved this power down after doing that or moved it out in front of the log because that's what logs do for me. And then I've used the fact that the natural log of e is one. In fact, that's why I chose the natural log was so this, this thing would cancel and just become a one. Let's just keep track of what we were trying to solve for was this r. And I need to see r equals something. So I'll just do that in my last step, that r equals one half log of three halves, the natural log of three halves. And that's another key piece of this equation that I need was what was this value of r? Okay, now I just have to sort of summarize what I've done, put it all together. I have this equation here this is the thing I, oops, uh, seem to have deleted it, but there we go. So this is the thing that will be the answer, right? Because they were asking for a function, w of t. So I need to tell them what that function is. So there's my w of t. And I had this w naught equals 4. So let me just sub that in. And over here, I have this r equals 1 half log of 3 halves. So this was one half natural log of three halves. And then there's still this times t on the end. And now I actually know I'm good to go because I have a formula um, in terms of numbers and there, there are no unknowns. You might be a little bit worried about the t, but here, I mean, the t is just the independent variable. It's telling you how to map inputs to outputs. Um, so that can stay in the problem. And I'll just mention here, so if you wanted, this would be totally fine as an answer. Sorry, Camille is uh, coming up to help again. So this would be totally fine as an answer. So you could box this and put that as your answer if you want. I'll just point out that there is a really nice um, simplification here. Just notice that this, this right-hand side is just equal to 4 times e to the... So everything up here is in the exponent but I have something in front of the log, so I can just move it up as an exponent to the argument of the log. So I get e to the well, 3 halves to the 1 half power. So gosh, I guess that's square root of 3 halves. And then I have a times t on the outside. And I can actually cancel a little bit here. This whole thing is just equal to 4 times root 3 halves times e to the t. So I guess I've, I've used a step here where I've written this as 4 e to the log root 3 halves times e to the t. Or, uh, ooh, yeah, sorry, I've made a mistake here. Let me roll this back a little bit. Yeah, it's okay. Moral of the story here is don't skip too many steps. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I should be a little bit careful. Uh, so this thing is equal to 4 times e to the log of root 3 halves. And then this whole thing raised to the tth power. Right, because that's how multiplication upstairs happens. It happens when you exponentiate something. Uh, if this was a plus, then I could do what I was doing before, which was separating it out into two different bases. So just, yeah, I guess that's a... 
a uh, mistake to, to watch out for even i make it um but okay so now what happens here is i can simplify this this middle thing in the same way and this is four times uh well square root of three halves to the tth power so i mean yeah i don't know it's, it's a little bit nicer i guess than having all of this I see a log, a natural log upstairs, and I see an E in the base, and I think, oh, well, you know, maybe we can combine these and simplify some stuff. Um, you can get a little bit of a simpler formula, but yeah, don't worry about it too much. Okay, so let's look at this next question, which was part B. Um, and this one is a little bit of uh, you know, free points. As long as you studied and were keeping up with the class notes, uh, this is something that's just written down directly in, uh, I think it was like the Friday's lecture before this exam. And so what it's asking here is, uh, well, we want to find a functional inverse of this function, f of x equals log base alpha of x. And alpha is some unknown positive real number. So this could be like alpha equals e. So like what's the inverse, the functional inverse of the natural log of x? This could be log base 10. What's the functional inverse of log base 10 of x? So the first thing, well, you can see that this is bolded. You have to kind of know what the what this, this vocab word functional inverse means. So what I need for this to be a functional inverse is that, well, f of, well, we need two things. We need f of f composed with g evaluated at x should just be x. And then we also need that g compose with f evaluated at x should also be equal to x. And I've just written these in this, this funny compose notation. This is exactly the same thing as f evaluated at g evaluated at x. And that needs to be equal to x. And so I'm just, these are the same thing if you want. And the second one is just saying g evaluated at f evaluated at x should be equal to x. So that's just what it means to be uh, to have a, a pair of functions that are functional inverses. They both compose to the identity function, the function that just takes your input variable, your independent variable, and just gives it back to you. It doesn't do anything to it. It's the identity. And then if you compose it in the other order, it has the exact same effect. You send in an input, and it just gives you back your output. OK, and well, for better or worse, this is just something, it's it's sort of a fact from class that what is the the, the inverse of, so if we have f of x is equal to log base alpha of x. This is something we've used a bunch of times. At this g of x, if you want, you can think of this as like f inverse of x is just equal to alpha to the x. And why is that? Well, maybe you just want to do a quick check uh, essentially this this check here compose them in both orders so what is f evaluated at g of x so this would be log base alpha of now I need to replace this x with all of this function so it should be alpha to the x and okay that's x times log base alpha of alpha I've just taken this exponent I see it's on the entire argument so I can just move it out and then this thing is just 1, so this is just equal to x. So I know that works. And then you just have to check that in the other order, this is something that we just have as a fact from class. Alpha, right, so let me let me just say I'm getting this. I'm, we're composing g compose f of x. So this says take g of x, there it is, alpha to the x. Except everywhere I see an x, plug in all of this stuff. So that x becomes a log base alpha of x. And this is just a fact from class that that's, this is what we've been using in the, all of the previous problems that really when you send anything in here, you get that thing back. And in particular, it works if that thing is just x. So this was the, uh, the x everywhere. Okay, and that's all you really have to do to, to show that these, these are functional inverses. Um, I guess the question didn't even really ask you to show that. Uh, it just said, you know, say what the functional inverse is. Um, and hopefully if you got the first couple of problems, you were using this fact. Um, so hopefully you just remembered that, you know, if you have log base alpha, it just needs to be alpha to the x. 
and that this this works for more than just like the the natural log in e or like 10 and log base 10 it's really log base alpha any alpha pick your favorite alpha and then alpha to the x maybe don't pick your favorite alpha if your favorite is negative or something um, but okay uh, okay, so this next question is about um, injectivity, and it's highlighted in bold here because this was sort of a, a technical vocab word from class, and we had a, a definition of it. Um, and here we're, we're going to be using one of these, these tests that we had to check um, injectivity. So remember that this is exactly the same as being one-to-one, -one, and then the word injective is just to remind you that there's some, some technical thing you have to check. There was this algebraic equation about how inputs and outputs are related. So we're given the graph, so we have some function, again, remembering that functions can be all kinds of things, but this function happens to take real numbers as inputs and output real numbers so we can graph it. Um, just here on the Cartesian plane, we've graphed out this function. It's something that sort of looks like part of a sine wave. Um, and it looks like it's only on some restricted domain and some has some restricted range. So it isn't taking in all real numbers, just maybe only the real numbers that are uh, you know, in this, this sort of area here. All right, and so we need to decide in this first question, uh, I guess this is asking here, is this function injective? Um, and then we need to justify sort of why or why not in one sentence. And the hint here is a pretty good hint, I think. Uh, you may appeal to a line test, um, but if that's the case, if it like say fails injectivity, then you really need to like show the reader what line that is. It needs to fail one particular line test. Um, so, I mean, let's just go ahead and do it. Let's find one line on this, this thing that fails injectivity, that shows, you know, it fails injectivity. And the difficult question, uh, the hard thing to remember for this kind of problem is which line test do you do, right? There are two. You can do the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So, I mean, maybe if you have it memorized, you might remember that the vertical line test is something that's telling you about whether something is or is not a function. Right, this is telling you, you fix one input and you want this function to have this like deterministic property to where there's only one output you could send it to. That's what it means to pass the vertical line test because you're, I mean, it's exactly what I said in words, you're fixing one input, this X here, and you're looking at all of the, the outputs there. And in particular, so these are all the different you know, Y values. Anywhere this intersects the graph, that's telling you that function takes on that Y value there. And if that function takes on that y value twice, then that function, you, you send in an x, and then the function has to make some decision, right? Like, what, what y do I choose? Um, and so, I don't know, maybe functions aren't smart enough to make choices most of the time. So we say that something is a function, right? If you send in one input, and there's only one unique output that it goes to. So that's exactly the same thing as the, the vertical line test. And being able to go back and, and forth between these two interpretations is, is really important. Um, but okay, what we're looking for here, so if we know that that one's the, the one that tests for functions, then it's definitely the other one that tests for one-to-oneness, injectivity. So it's the horizontal line test. And here I, I see that, well, I can just sort of pick randomly, right? If I just pick this horizontal line, then certainly it's it's running into the function uh, just all over the place, there and there and there and there. Uh, and so what is this what is this telling me? So I fixed, by doing a horizontal thing, I fixed one output, I fixed one Y value. And I'm scanning to the left and right and asking myself, uh, where does the function take on this Y value? Are there multiple inputs that get mapped to this one Y value? So this is like subtle, but slightly different than being a function. A function is about fixing one input and asking, is there only one output it goes to? And then this horizontal line test is now about fixing one output and asking, what inputs did it come from? And if it's only one input, then we'll say it's one-to-one -one or injective. But in this case, we're seeing that it's coming from a whole lot of inputs. It's intersecting the graph in multiple places, which means that for this output, which is, I don't know, 3.1 or something, whatever it is, well, here's an input it comes from. It's like a negative 1.5 or something. Here's another input it comes from. This is like a negative 0.25, I mean, whatever it is. Here's another input it comes from, 2.5-ish. And there's another one, and 3.75 or something like that. So these are a bunch of different inputs all getting back to the same output. That's telling you that the function is not injective.
it's exactly the same same thing as this horizontal line test and in the same way that going back and forth between this um, line test and this input output perspective is, is extremely useful and extremely important okay so uh, what have we concluded from our analysis here uh, no it fails the horizontal line test and well it says that we can appeal to a line test but we should show a specific line so maybe I'll just say at the line L or something or maybe capital L and then maybe I'll just go up here and label this line that we drew capital L that's my line okay so that seems seems fine for that next question asks us to determine what is the domain and range of this function and we should write it in interval notation as is standard so let me erase all of this stuff and let's just look at um, see what we're working with here so the domain right is the set of all possible uh, or all of the inputs to this function that make sense all the inputs for which there is an output so if I look at something like negative 4 that's not in the domain because I don't know what function value to assign to negative 4 the graph doesn't exist there I don't have that information uh, but I do see that if I'm at like negative 1 for example then I can look up up and down above negative 1 and oh I see a point on the graph above or somewhere on that line um, x equals negative 1 and that's telling me that there's a y value for it so I know what the function is there that's telling me that this point is in the domain and so if you want to I mean yeah you can just continue that kind of process um, you can also do this sort of projection process we talked about where it's just like look at the sort of shadow when you shine a light from above and you shine a light from below and just see how much of the the axis you hit also if you kind of zoom in here so this point if you shine a light from above means you're getting a little square bracket here right I include that point when I'm doing this interval because if I look above this, uh, so this is negative 2 I guess then I have a, a function value there that's a closed circle so this is telling me that say negative 2 uh, 1 is on the graph so negative 2 is in the, dom the domain of this function because I know the output and negative 2 and then I see a bunch of stuff all here under the graph from shining this light from above and then I get here and okay now I'm shining a light from below and I'm getting all of this stuff and of course I'm including you know where these intersections are these are definitely in the domain and then I switch back to shining a light from above and I'm doing getting all of these x values and then just here I do the same thing this is a closed dot so this is something like x equals 4 and I guess this is y equals 1 is a, is a point on the graph so that tells me I can include 4 in the domain because I know what the output of the function is there it's just y equals 1 so that means it's in the domain the function knows how to handle it and now I just see what I'm left with well it's something like negative 2 to positive 4 where I include both endpoints okay so I'll go ahead and write that just record my findings here the domain of f is what was it uh, negative 2 to 4 and I'm just double check that I've included the endpoints now I want the range of f okay so let's go back up here and I'll get rid of all this stuff so we can uh, keep the clutter down so the range again is all of the, the attainable y values for the function um, if I just kind of look up here or maybe down here y equals negative 4 is not attainable because I'm, I'm fixing this y equals negative 4 here and looking out to the, the right and to the left and seeing that this doesn't hit the graph of the, the function anywhere um, so the function is not taking on y equals negative 4 anywhere so this is not in the set of uh, it's not in the range uh, but I see essentially everything in here will probably be so let me just be a little bit more precise about that um, I think uh, what I'll probably use here is this, this idea of for the range I just kind of want to shine a light from the left and shine a light from the right and see what values on the y-axis I hit so doing that here I see that you know starting here if I shine this light I get 
down to here on the axis, so I can include that point. Again, this closed dot is telling me that this y value is achieved, so that'll be included. I should be a little bit careful up here. I'm shining a light from the left. This point is on the graph, and that's like the highest point. So that's getting mapped over here. And I can include this point. This y equals, uh, looks like y equals 5, I guess. Because there's a, a point on the graph where y equals 5 is attained. Okay, and then I'm getting all of this stuff here in the middle, coming from the shadow of all of this stuff and all of this stuff. And I can keep going through. And this point I can include. Um, and now I need to shine a light from the, the right-hand side now. And it's the exact same game. This, this point is on the graph. So when I cast it over here, I include this, this uh, I guess this is negative 3. And the shadow of all this stuff will show up as this part of the interval. And it'll go up to here, and then I include that point in the middle too. And now I'm, if I'm thinking about, you know, casting a light from over here, well, I get all of this stuff, but oh good, I've already accounted for all of those y values. So now I just need to record my findings here. This went from y equals uh, positive 5, or really y equals negative 3, to y equals positive 5. So let me just record that. It was from negative 3, where I included that endpoint to positive 5. And again, I, if I were doing domain and range problems, the thing I would always check at the very end is, um, did I get the endpoints right? Did I include them or um, exclude them appropriately? And so I would just double check, did I need to include negative 3? Yes, I do, because there is a point on the graph that achieves y equals negative 3. So this is something like 1, negative 3. And that's an actual point on the graph, and so negative 3 is an achievable y value for this function, which means that it's in the range. Okay, so I have the domain and range, and I guess maybe I'll highlight this for the reader, just in case. And then maybe I'll also highlight for that previous problem that the answer was no. Okay, and the next part's a little bit tricky. It's asking us to do something a little bit new. Determine some new, smaller, restricted domain for which this function is injective. So this function isn't injective, right? We saw that in part one. We proved it with that flat line test. We showed it. Um, and we want to fix it somehow, like, not being injective is not good, right? Because we saw that injective functions are great because they let us like apply things to both sides of an equation and then keep going in that uh, equation solving process. So that was really nice. Um, and it helped us define inverse functions. So if we can restrict the domain to make this function injective, then we can have like a nicer function where maybe we can apply it to both sides of an equation and help us solve more equations. So that's the point of this. Um, so we need to somehow find a smaller domain for which this, this injectivity works, and then we need to explain why exactly that's, that's true. So let's just go back up to this, graph and delete all of the clutter we have from the previous one. And so I need to restrict the domain, so I need to um, throw out some x values. Um, and I don't know, so what's, what's preventing this function from being injective, right? It was really just that, that problem we ran into uh, at first, where it was just failing the horizontal line test in some places. But uh, so all I have to do, I guess, to make it injective is just make it not fail the horizontal line test. So I can just pick some some little region of the graph where it's clear that you know maybe every horizontal line only intersects uh, one, intersects the graph once. So there are a lot of of good choices here, plenty of good choices. Um, but notice that there are some bad choices. For example, I can't take, uh, let me see, just this chunk of the graph, for example, would not work. If I tried to do all of this, I would be uh, not in a great uh, situation because I would still be failing the horizontal line test in a few places. So there are some intersections. That wouldn't be great. Um, kind of the same thing. Like anytime I, I crest over one of these, include both sides of it or something, I'm failing the horizontal line test. This is telling me that maybe I don't want to uh, to go farther than this this maximum or something. If I just take this half, that's fine. But okay, let's just keep going. I mean, if I just continue it a little bit farther, that's fine. I can still keep passing all of these horizontal line tests. So just keep going, see how far you can go. Well, I get down to this, and I've taken a lot, passing the horizontal line test everywhere. 
but I think as soon as I go past this uh, this min here and start coming up again, I'm going to run into problems. Um, so I'm going to start failing that horizontal line test again. So again, as soon as I cross that at a minimum, I can go kind of arbitrarily close to that minimum, no matter what. As long as I'm taking anything past it, I know I can zoom in, zoom in really far, and I'm going to fail the horizontal line test because every little region uh, around that this like point here, if I kind of put a magnifying glass around it, it's going to look like this kind of thing. So I need to like leave out all of all of this stuff on the left hand side if I want to make this work. So okay, just leave it out. There we go. And I guess I need to be a little bit careful. We're just going to take everything from here up to everything here. We'll take all of this part of the graph and that'll be fine. All of these horizontal lines will only intersect once. And now I just need to figure out what does that domain correspond to? I'll just play this projection game, shine a light from below, and this will go down to, uh, looks like one, and I can include that one, that's fine. Uh, right, because if I, if I include anything off to this side of one, then I'm in trouble, because if I include this point, then there's gonna be a corresponding point over here, and a horizontal line going between those. But it's fine if I just include this this point at the mid because there's there's no matching pair for it to uh, have a line with. And over here I can play the same game, just project down, and I'll get this point three. And for the exact same reason, I can go ahead and, and include three. And then just looking at the shadow under this, I get all of this portion of the, the x-axis here. I'm looking at the shadow of all of this stuff. And so I think this gives me one to three is a perfectly fine region where this stuff will work or where this function will be injective. So let's just record that. So new domain. And whatever we had was, uh, so it was one to three. And box it, highlight it, let the reader know that that's what they, the new domain they should take. And okay, I'll just check whether this matches up with the hint. The hint says we, we may appeal to a line test again. So I guess we need to justify and explain why this is true. Why is f injective on this new domain? Well, you just look at this new domain, you realize that it'll pass the horizontal line test everywhere. That's kind of how we, we cooked it up in the first place. It was by picking some really big domain or just kind of picking a little bit and seeing that it passed the line test there and then just keep extending until we fail the line test. So that's what I would write down if you're, you know, trying to justify it. And then does this, uh, do we have this this thing where it says the new domain should be some interval contained in the interval we wrote above for this domain? Well, here is this domain negative two to four. So let's just draw that really quickly on a number line. So there's zero, there's negative two, there's four. And this was my first domain. And now my new domain is this one, two, three, and oh good, that's an interval contained in the, the one we had before. And so that's just a copy of the, the real line. And okay, so I know that this solution checks out. And again, there could be many, many solutions here. You could take sort of any other part of the graph where the, the horizontal line test has passed everywhere. So you could also take, you know, this little branch of the, the curve, or you could take like this branch over here, everything up to that max point, um, you could just take this branch over here, sort of a lot of different options. You could also take something something kind of weird, like you could take like just this stuff and then some of this stuff down here if you wanted. And you would still pass the horizontal line test if you were careful about it. Um, okay. So this next part of the, the problem is asking us to show, now using the, the definition of injectivity, that this function is injective. Let's just remember that there was injectivity. We use this word because there was a technical meaning. There was this algebraic equation associated with it that we needed to remember. And what is that uh, definition? So the definition was that F is injective if and only if. So I write this IFF to mean that, which just means this is a, a definition. The implication goes both ways. If and only if. Whenever you have f of 
a equal to f of b, you can logically conclude that a is equal to b. So what does that mean in English? This is saying that if you have two outputs that are equal, if your function is to be injective, then those two, um, the two corresponding inputs should have been equal to. Um, right? Hopefully you have to think through this a little bit. What does it mean to not be injective? Well, it means if you had, uh, you had one output. Sorry, I think I phrased this incorrectly. Let me, let me back up. Um, what does it mean to be injective? This means if you, if you start with this one output, so this is one, these two things are equal, um, but it's the output of the function where it was coming at potentially two different points, A and B, that were mapping to it. So, so it's one output potentially coming from two inputs, but you can logically conclude that the two inputs had to be equal. There was really only one input to begin with. So that's what, that's what it means to be injective. What does it mean to not be injective? Well, it means you had one output, which looked like they were from two inputs, and then, oh yeah, they were. They were from two inputs, or potentially more. So one output coming from many inputs is not injective. One output coming from exactly one input is injective. But okay, you just have to remember this algebraic equation. You know, we have a formula for it, this kind of thing. So let's just do it. We wanna start with this thing. So they've kind of spoiled it for us in the question, right? They've said to prove that it's injective, which means that it probably is injective. So we just have to start with this thing, do some steps, and conclude this thing. So what does it mean for f of a to be equal to f of b? So we have f of a equal to f of b. Well, now I'm just going to plug. So I, I have a name for f of x, right? It's f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x. Uh, hopefully, is that what it was? Yeah. Oh, I guess there's a little bit of interpretation here. Yeah, I should, I should mention this. So we have this kind of, uh, this funky notation for the function, uh, and it's worth, you know, parsing out what, what, what exactly does this mean? How does this match up with things we've been seeing in class? So just remember that this is the, the name of the function. I could call it anything. I could call it f. I could give it some long word of a name, like sine or cosine or something. Um, and then I've told you kind of the universe where the inputs live and the universe where the outputs live. And then I've told you how the inputs map to the outputs. In other words, I've given you a formula for how it works. Um, and just remember that functions are very abstract. Not all of them have formulas, but in this case we have one. And then let's just remember that this is exactly the same thing as saying f of x is equal to one plus x. And just remember the problem was that this didn't tell you all of this, this other information, like what is the name of the independent variable? What kind of inputs and outputs does it take? And even like, what is the, the name of the function? It's all kind of there, but it's all kind of mixed up together. Okay, so f of a is equal to f of b. What does that mean? Well, I have a name for how f maps inputs to outputs. It maps the input a to one over one plus a. It maps the input b to one over one plus b. So again, remember that I get to start with this assumption and I just need to do a bunch of steps and conclude a equals b, right? So that's what I need to get to, a equals b at the end of the day. So that's the goal. How do we get there? Well, um, all right, I see denominators again, so I'm going to play the game of uh, clear everything from the denominators. So I get 1 plus b is equal to 1 plus a, if you want, just by cross-multiplying these guys or if you want, really, just by multiplying through by 1 over 1 plus b, and then this side becomes a 1, this becomes a 1 plus b over 1 plus a, and now multiply through by 1 plus a to clear that denominator, and then you get a 1 plus a on this side. It's so, okay, whatever floats your boat. Um, what I can do now is subtract 1 from both sides and get b equals a, and that's exactly what I wanted to show, right? This was the, the, whole, the whole definition of injectivity was that I just had to Start with this assumption, do some steps, conclude a equals b. So I started with that assumption, I did some steps, and I concluded a is equal to b. So I've shown that this is injective. Okay, so I, I think this one was really just an exercise in, um, you know, making sure you're kind of, uh, you know, you went back and looked at the lecture notes to see what this definition of an injectivity was. And we stressed really the, the importance of it has this, this very special definition. And then also just being familiar with this notation that we've been using in class um, about how to 
you know, write a function and map inputs to outputs and then how to sort of get the usual, you know, notion you're seeing in the pre-classes and worksheets back out of that. Okay, uh, so let's look at the next question. Next up, we have something about uh, investing money into a fund with a certain interest rate and it's compounded once every month. So let's see, we have, uh, let's try to scan out the keywords here. We wanna write some mathematical equation and probably solve it. So what information do we need to, to glean from this? Well, there's a number, 1.1%. Here's some important info. It's compounded once per month. So that sounds kind of like a number, once. This is probably gonna be an important uh, part of our equation. We have an initial investment. Initial, right, is like time t equals zero or something. And there's some initial amount, some number. And then how much money will be in the account after three years is what we're trying to find out. So gosh, I have all of these words. I would really like to, to write down a mathematical equation, do some translation process, solve this mathematical equation, um, and come up with an answer for this. So the first thing I need to realize is that uh, this is asking about compound interest, and we have some formulas for compound interest. And it's important to recognize that this is once per month, so this is not continuously compounded, which would be like not just once every second or every microsecond or every nanosecond, uh, continuously, every possible instance in time. But this isn't that. This is just once every 30 days, once every month or something. So the first thing I need is the equation for uh, compound interest uh, compounded discreetly. So we had this, this notation for it in the notes, which was a d of t. And this was equal to, well, there was just a general form for it. Uh, there was a 1 plus r over n to the nt. This was like the important part of it. And then there was also this a naught out in front. Okay, so I want to, uh, before I do much with this, I want to light up what is the independent variable, t, it was just a name I gave for how the inputs map to outputs. And this helps me find out the other things that I need to identify in this problem if I want to, to answer this question. I might need to identify a naught, r, and n. So let me just try to write those out. I need to identify a naught is equal to question mark, r is equal to question mark, and n is equal to question mark. So what are these things? Let's see if we can, if, did the problem just give them to us? Maybe, uh, let's, let's try to find this out. Uh, so the interest rate is 1.1%, and that's uh, that's actually corresponding exactly to my, uh, my R. My R stands for rate. Um, so I should just be a little bit careful here because, right, this was 1.1%. Uh, and the problem is, is that percentages aren't numbers, they're ratios. And so percent, right, is mean, this means per. So, okay, 1.1 per cent means 1.1. Per is like a division. Cent is like 100 percent divided by 100. So, okay, if you want, this is equal to 0. Point, uh, oh, gosh, I don't even think I want to do that. I just want to leave it as, let's do 11 over 1,000. Just leave it as some, some nice ratio of integers. Um, okay, so we have the R. We need the N. I think we, we can probably find that. This was once every month. Just remember that this N in this equation was how many times you could pound uh, per year. Uh, plus this equation was set up to be in years. And so if we're once per month, then we're 12 times per year. So that this N is 12. And now we need to find out what this A naught was. So let's just take a look at this um, equation. Uh, so one, one way to see what that is, is if you plug in t equals zero uh, in this equation, this doesn't always happen, but in this case, uh, you plug in t equals zero and this whole term, while well, you're raising something to the zeroth power, that something is a, a positive number. It's a number bigger than one even. So it's some positive number to the zero power, which is just one. Okay, so this whole term just becomes a one, which means that this thing evaluated at zero is just equal to this a naught. And okay, I guess that's what this is telling us here, that this thing evaluated at zero was equal to this number, 250,000. So there's my A naught, 250,000. Okay, so I think I have my equation now. It's A D of T, A sub D of T. 
Well, it's equal to 250,000, whatever that number is, times 1 plus, uh, so this was R, 11 over 1,000. divided by something, that was this n, 12. And then I need, needed to raise it to the n t power. So this is 12 times t. And I just want to check, am I actually done? Did I get a full equation? Well, there's my independent variable. That's fine, it can still be a letter. Everything else is a number. So I know I actually have a model now. So I have a, everything's a number. I can plug times into this and I can get things out of it, like real predictions. So I've eliminated all of the unknown variables. And so that's great. Uh, is this what the question was asking? Let's go back and figure out what the original problem was. There's the question mark at the very end. Let's read backwards. Uh, they wanted to know how many, or how much, what is the balance in the account after three years? Well, the whole point of this equation was that we could plug in time values t, and this would just tell you the balance at that point. Uh, again, this was like we're gaining interest on money in an account. So AD of T is like how much money is in your account after uh, T years, remembering that this whole equation was set up to work in years to begin with. So that just means that I need to plug in AD of 3, and I won't even rewrite it. It's literally just all of this stuff, except for this purple T became a purple 3. And at this point, I will leave it up to you to plug it into your calculator and get some number. And then just be careful to indicate to your reader that you're taking some, some approximation here. Um, right? Like you can imagine, like, if it's you looking at your savings account, maybe just uh, estimating it to the cent or whatever, like to two dig digits uh, in decimal places is fine. But you can imagine if you're like a high frequency trading firm or something, maybe you want to know it all the way down to like the millionth of a cent because that, you know, adds up over 10 million transactions to some significant amount of money or something. So indicate to the reader that you've, you've taken some approximation. Um, and then, you know, that's your answer. You've, you've plugged in t equals 3 to get the balance at three, 3 years. So I, I, won't, I won't bother writing that out here. I'll just leave it up to you to plug whatever this is into your calculator. In fact, if you if you wanted to, you don't even have to plug it. <laughs> if you wanted to just leave uh, this as your answer, that would be totally fine for this kind of class. Because that's it's an exact, it's a precise answer. Anybody else can plug it in if they want. Okay, so I think this is either the last question or the second to last. Um, and this is probably the most difficult one, but this is one that's very, very similar to what we did in class. And there's a little bit of a, a trick to it. So we have this, this same situation as class where we have a petri dish filled with bacteria. And we're supposing that it's, it's modeled by an exponential equation, uh, or rather the, the weight of this dish is modeled by an exponential equation. Um, and we're supposing it's exponential decay of some sort. So we don't have a bacteria colony uh, growing over time. It's, it's the weight of it is going down, it's shrinking. Um, and it's an exponentially shrinking. And so we see, we see that it's given by W of t, some function that models exponential decay. And we have um, like a general form for that equation. Um, so that'll be like the first thing we find. And then we're given some data points. So after t equals 30 days, uh, we go and weigh it and we find that W of 30, okay, so what does that mean? It's, it's this function, W of t, evaluated at 30 days. So this is the weight at day 30. And that's 200 grams. And then something goes wrong, we leave the lab for vacation or something for 20 days, we come back and we measure, uh, gosh, our, our bacteria colony is dying. Uh, at 50 days, we only have 150 grams of it left. So um, what we'd like to do is build a model for this and use it to predict some data point that we didn't collect. Um, so here we want to, we only collected data at t equals 30 and t equals 50, and we want to make some prediction about what did it look like at t equals zero. Uh, days. What was its initial weight? Uh, how much has, has died over time in that, that 50 days, like total? Uh, so let's, let's see if we can figure that out. So the first thing we need to do is we need a, uh, like a general form uh, for this kind of equation if we want to try to build this model. So we had this in class that anytime we have a, 
an exponential sort of uh, growth or decay situation, we can model it by this, this function here, w of t is equal to w naught e to the r t. So remember that t can stick around because t is our independent variable. And then we have some unknown numbers, r and w naught, these parameters. And if we want this to be a model, if we want to make actual predictions and get numbers out, then we need to uh, determine what these unknowns are. We need to make them known uh, and find actual numbers for them. Okay, so let's just record some other data that we have. So this was just some general form that we had from class. Um, and you can actually see that it's the exact same equation as continuously compounded interest, which is a form of exponential uh, growth in that case. And the only difference here is that if it's decayed, maybe this R might be negative or something. But it's this is kind of one of the miraculous things about math is that one equation can model uh, sort of a lot of very different seeming seemingly different things. So let's record some other things that we have about this problem. One piece of data we have is that W of 30 is just equal to 200. So there's W of 30 equal to 200. And then we also had some information about W of 50. This was equal to 150 grams. Okay, so this is at least uh, giving me hope that I can solve this equation. I have uh, two unknowns appearing in this equation. And I also have two pieces of data. So I have two equations and two unknowns. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can probably solve this. If I just had one equation, I would not be so hopeful. Right? One equation and two unknowns, uh, chances are I won't be able to pin it down precisely. Okay, so just following the exact same procedure we, we did in class, let's work on this first piece of data. So we have w of 30 is equal to 200. This is just one name for the output of the function when I plug in 30. But I have another name for it. Here it is. Make a copy of it. And uh, gosh, so this is really, I've just written down w of t, but I need to plug in this purple t equals 30. So that needs to become a 30. And I get some equation out of this. So these are just two different names for the same thing. So that means they're equal. So I get something that's like 200 is equal to w naught e to the 30 r. Okay, that's as far as I can go with this. Um, but I want to now do the exact same thing. I've, I've used up my first piece of data. I've somehow used that information already. Now I want to use this piece of data. And I'm just going to play the same game. w of 50, I have a name for it, 150. It's that name there. I have another name for it. Well, it's the original equation. This thing here. But oh gosh, that thing was W at T. And here I'm taking purple T equals 50. So let's plug in 50 there. And now I have two names for the same thing. So I can set them equal to each other. So this tells me that, uh, let's set it up to be similar to the first one, 150 is equal to, well, w naught e to the 50 times r. Okay, so we just did that process twice on our two pieces of data. Uh, and now we need to do something kind of clever. We need to solve for uh, w naught and r in this. And the clever thing to do is to take these two and divide them. And so we saw that if you divide you can essentially, yeah, let me, you can take one equation, uh, like inequality, and divide it by an, another equation. And you just do this by dividing both of the, the two sides. So what I can get from this is that I have 200 over 150 is equal to, so I've just taken this and divided it by that. And that has to be equal to taking this and dividing it by that. Okay, so that is W naught e to the 30r over w naught e to the 50r. But okay, some nice things happen here. The, the reason why this was clever is because um, I've canceled out this w naught. That's kind of the clever bit. So, so that's the, uh, the trick to sort of solving this. 
And what that means is that I've gotten something that looks like, well, let me just con uh, condense the, the left-hand side. So this is something like, uh, gee, it's 20 over 15, which is like, uh, oh, let's see, it's divided by five. So four over three. So I get four thirds on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I'm left with e to the 30r over e to the 50r. But okay, now I can use my exponent rules. This is e to the 30r times e to the negative 50r. And I just use this fact that any time I have something raised to a power and it's in a denominator, I can move it up to the numerator as long as I flip the sign on it. And just remember, it's not um, always just changing it to a negative. If it, if it was already a negative, you would have to flip the sign and change it to a positive. So anytime you take something in the denominator, move it upstairs to the numerator, just flip the sign and turn it, uh, turn this division into multiplication. And now I'm going to use another exponent rule that if I have, so I have two, um, uh, two things raised to some powers and they they have like bases. So that means that I can combine them into a single base. So e to the 30 R and this multiplication downstairs becomes addition upstairs and it's plus a negative 50 R. And okay, I'm being a little bit daft about it. I 30 plus negative 50, but it's just to be clear that you only have to memorize the one rule about how multiplication uh, and addition work. And then you get the ones for subtraction and division for free. Um, so 30 minus 50, I guess this is a e to the negative 20 R. And okay, just summarizing what I have, I have that kind of equality there. So let me just write that down here. So I have four thirds is equal to e to the negative 20 R. Um, and right now I can just take the natural log on both sides. Maybe before I do that, just to, um, to make things a little bit cleaner, um, I will take reciprocals of both sides. So I'm just gonna get rid of the, the negative sign. So if you want, I multiply both sides by e to the 20 R. Let me just do that. So I get e to the 20 R times four thirds equals e to the 20 R times e to the negative 20 R. And I'm just gonna use, so the reason I did this is because I see this multiplication downstairs, which I can turn into addition upstairs. And this whole thing becomes a zero. It's e to the zero equals one. So that's the whole reason I did that. And then I'll just multiply through by three quarters and that'll cancel this, and I'll get a three quarters on that side. It's just to get rid of the negative sign, just a silly trick here. You could just go ahead and apply logs, but you would have another negative sign floating around to keep track of. Um, but another way to see this is I've literally just taken the reciprocal of both sides. The so reciprocal of four thirds is three quarters, and that's showing up there. And then one over e to the negative 20 r is e to the positive 20 r, because I can just move it upstairs and put the sign. Okay, but now I can just take logs. So I get 20r is the natural log of three quarters. And lo and behold, I've solved for r, and it's just in terms of numbers. So it's 1 20th times the log, the natural log of three quarters. So that's not my final answer, but I'll box it because I need it. It's part of, part of the answer I need. Uh, so that's r equals 1 20th of natural log of three quarters, what else do we need? We need this uh, this w naught, right? So we have this r, and we need now this w naught. And you can really just pick, um, I guess we can go back to these equations. These, either of these will give it to us. So let's just pick this one, totally arbitrarily, to work on now. And so I just have that this, this is inequality that I have. But I know this r now, so I, I can write this as 200 equals w naught e to the 30 r, but whatever r was, r was 1 20th natural log of 3 quarters. All right. And okay, I want to, uh, yeah, I really want to solve for this w naught. So maybe I'm just going to 
all of this is just some number, but maybe I'll simplify it really quickly. So this is w naught times e to the 30 over 20 times the natural log of 3 quarters. And I really want to cancel this two, these two, uh, but there's this pesky uh, number out in front in the way, so I need to do something with that. So there's w naught e to the natural log, well there's uh, 3 quarters, and I just remember that I can move this stuff up into the exponent if it's just multiplying out in front. So that's a 30 over 20 up in the exponent. And okay, now I can finally cancel these guys. I get a w naught 3 quarters to the 30 over 20. And let's just remember that this was equal to 200. And oh good, now I just have w naught equal to uh, 200 divided by 3 quarters to the 30 over 20. Or I guess we can just call this, uh, let's simplify this, this is 3 halves. This is 3 halves. Okay, that's an important part of my solution too. I'll need that w naught. And so now I can actually get a full, full on equation for this. Uh, so I have this here was my equation. And the whole goal was to find the two unknown parameters. But there we go, I have uh, w naught. So let me just substitute that in. There we go, that's our whole w naught. And then I had an r, so let me just substitute that in. So here, here it is, there. Uh, I guess maybe shrink it so it can all fit in the exponent. Okay, and then I get, uh, gosh, this this huge awful equation. I guess you could simplify it a little bit. Um, but I guess that just is the equation. Right, everything I'm seeing now, I'm just seeing that one purple independent variable appearing in my formula. And, oh, whoops, uh, that R we substituted in was all of this stuff. And the w naught we substituted in was all of this stuff, and so everything appearing, everything else other than the t, uh, is a number. All right, and that just means that now we have a model. We can plug things into it. We can extract information. What was the question asking? Uh, it was asking how much did it weigh at t equals zero days. So all we have to do is take our model, uh, make a copy of it here. So there's our model. And if I just plug in t equals zero, so I just plug in a zero there, and I get a zero there, and I'm just raising e to the zero power, so that just becomes a one. And then the only thing that's left is just whatever that is. And I guess if you plug that into your calculator, you'll get some, uh, some weight. Uh, so I'll leave it up to you to figure out what that is. Uh, but maybe if you're recording that on a, you know, if you're telling your reader about it, if it's not some exact number, be sure to tell them that it's an approximation. Okay, so I think that is, let me double check, I think that's it for this exam. Um, hopefully that is helpful to you guys. Uh, if you guys have any questions uh, about any anything on the exam, I'm happy to go over things in more detail, uh, although that's already quite a lot of detail. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, feel free to, to contact me via email uh, at any point. All right, thank you very much.